Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a situation with a whistleblower who was disciplined and whether or not that was proper. This is the case of Thomas Nagel versus City of Jamestown, North Dakota. In this case, there was some evidence that the police were using governmental property for personal purposes. Not good. And someone decided to report on it. And this person was fired as a result. So we're going to learn whether or not this was proper, whether or not this person can get their job back. Let's get started with this. In late October 2015, Station KVLY Whistleblower Hotline received a packet of documents accusing a member of the Sheriff's Department of using a county-owned jet ski for personal use. Nice. The packet included a printed screenshot of Deputy Sheriff Matt Tom riding a jet ski with Sheriff Chad Kaiser's son. KVLY identified the screenshot as Tom Facebook profile picture. <laughs> the Facebook account that printed Tom's photo was connected by KVLY reporter to Christine Stanwood to a Facebook profile named Dominique. So, so the whistleblower had reported this and includes screenshots, which linked to a screen to a Facebook profile, and they were able to figure out what Facebook profile. So they're able to figure out who was leaking it to them. So I suppose the, the, uh, the takeaway here is if you're going to call the whistleblower hotline, you might want to do more work to uh, hide your identity here because you left enough trails for them to figure out who you were. Good, good, just good work. On November the 4th, Stanwood took the whistleblower packet to the Stuntsman County Courthouse to investigate. Nagel identified the screenshot as a picture of Tom on a jet ski, but denied sending the packet to the whistleblower hotline. He consented to be interviewed. So this person is getting interviewed. They think he's the whistleblower. And he said, yeah, this is what it purports to be. But he's saying, I'm not the whistleblower, but I'm going to talk to you anyway. Good stuff. Stan Wall's narration then explains that the Facebook profile attached to the packet, Dominique Brim, was an alias for the detective Tom Nagel, who also happens to be president of the Fraternal Order of Police. So they're saying that this, this packet from this Facebook user, Dominique Brim, was in fact a police detective riding on his own, Tom Nagel, who was also the president of the Eternal Order of Police. So that, that's pretty interesting because, you know, the, we normally on the thin blue line, we see like the police union really sticking up for their fellow cop, fellow police officers. But in this case, we have the president of the Fraternal Order of Police riding on one of their own, who himself is an officer. So that's, you know, interesting. Good times. The news clip included images of the vehicles and excerpts of Nagel's interview with Stanwood, in which he confirmed that Dominique Brim was his alias, so he eventually confirmed it was him, but he denied sending the packet. I was aware of the photography and what was in it, but I didn't mail it. So he's saying that this picture, which was used to expose this person, was on his profile, but he's claiming he didn't mail it in. So that's good. There was an immediate strong reaction to the news clip, you don't say, at the Stutzman County Courthouse which houses both the sh police and the sheriff's department. So that's cute. The courthouse itself houses the police and sheriff's department. So this is just going to be the talk of the water cooler everywhere. On the following day, Sheriff Kaiser asked en Enninger to keep Nagel out of sheriff's department, which is separated from the, from the police department by a hallway so we could manage the chaos in the department. Very good. County Auditor Bradley told Enninger that one or more county commissioners called for Nagel's resignation. <laughs> The county banned Nagel from its offices and revoked the Fraternal Order of Police's contracts to operate ATM and vending machines in the county portion of the courthouse. Wow. Morale in both law enforcement agencies suffered. So one of the police officers uh, purportedly ratted someone else, and it, it basically caused everyone to completely freak out, including for calls for the police officer who reportedly did the whistleblowing to be fired. So that's super encouraging. On November the 10th, Chief Ettinger, Sheriff Kaiser, and County Attorney asked the North Dakota Bureau of Criminal Investigation to conduct an investigation of the jet ski incident for potential crimes and policy violations. The Bureau of Criminal Investigations assigned Special Agent Maxinger to investigate. His report stated that the County Auditor Bradley persuaded reporter Stanwood and her supervisor by speakerphone that Stutzman County did not own a jet ski by providing a listing of Stutzman County assets and insurance coverages. So they're saying it wasn't a police jet ski after all. The report identified Nagel as the subject of the investigation. 
In late February, Johnson and Falk submitted reports summarizing their findings and conclusions from the internal investigation. Major Johnson of the police department, nice name, Major Johnson concluded that Nagel's statements in the interview would not lead the public to believe he was clearing his name and his appearance brought discredit to himself and also the police and sheriff's department. Major Falk noted that four individuals interviewed recalled Nagel telling them that he knew who sent the packet. Falk concluded it's extremely difficult to not believe that Detective Nagel is protecting the identity of whoever is responsible in the false identification. Why would the police need a jet ski? Well, the police need to enforce uh, boating regulations. Uh, many places require boating licenses. They have to be maintained, and it is it is a violation of law to DUI on the water just as much as anywhere else. And I can tell you for an absolute certainty that my current town does own jet skis for their police department, presumably for these reasons. So, to enforce forced laws on the water. In a March 2016 letter to the city administrator, Jeff Jeffrey Fuchs, wow, Edinger agreed with the review board and recommended Nagel's termination. The review board determined that Sergeant Nagel violated 19 policies and also the 20th secret policy of writing out one its own, Edinger noted. He opined that Nagel violated the police officer's, apologies, peace officer's code of conduct by being aware of the alleged felony misuse of government property and not reporting. <laughs> so he, he gets in trouble not only for ratting on his fellow officer, but not ratting using official channels. That's good stuff. Nagel promptly appealed to the Jamestown Civil Service Commission, which conducted an eight-hour post-termination hearing on April the 27th. Nagel, represented by counsel, submitted 121 exhibits, called seven witnesses, including five experts, made an opening statement, examined and cross-examined witnesses, and submitted a 100-page closing brief. That is a lot of brief, man. On May the 20th, the commission affirmed Nagel's dismissal, and this lawsuit followed. So, yeah, we get to the crux of the issue. Nagel, a police officer who himself was president of the Fraternal Order of Police, may or may not have leaked information regarding another police officer's purported misuse of a jet ski, which may or may not have belonged to the government. And in any event, um, this person was fired for, for making these statements. And so the question is, is he a whistleblower that's protected or is his being fired justified? Let's read on. One, one, of, the, one of the nice things... One of the nice things about California's gun laws and New Jersey's gun laws and New York's gun laws, one of the nice things about it is suddenly a lot more of my left-leaning brethren seem to be trying to run to get guns, and now they can't. The schadenfreude is real. The schadenfreude is real. The First Amendment protects a public employee's right in certain circumstances to speak as a citizen addressing matters of public concern, citing a case called Gariachi. Garrity notes two inquiries in determining whether a public employee speech is protected against retaliation. The first requires determining whether an employee spoke as a citizen on a matter of public concern. If the answer is no, the employee has no First Amendment cause of action based on his or her employee's reaction to the speech. If the answer is yes, then the possibility of a First Amendment claim arises. The question becomes where the relevant government entity has an adequate justification for treating the employee different from any other member of the general public. The critical question under the case law is whether the speech at issue is itself ordinarily within the scope of duties, not whether it merely concerns the duties. Under Garachi, when a public employee speaks on a matter of public concern pursuant to his official duties, speech is unprotected against employer retaliation. So I'll just give you a little bit about what that's talking about. So if you're speaking as part of your official duties, it's not your speech, right? Because it's part of your official duties. You're an employee, and you're an employee of the government in this case. So it's the government's speech, not your speech. So you're acting as an agent for the government. And like any agent, you have to follow the rules of the principal, just as in this case is the government. So if you say something that's not authorized, then they can punish you and fire you for it because you're disobeying your role as an employee. So it's not really a First Amendment interest so much as it is your interest in you know being a good employee or not. By contrast, if you're talking about matters outside of your employment, or you're talking about matters outside of your official role, then you can give an opinion because you're not speaking as the government. So the question essentially, to keep it short, is are you speaking as you or are you speaking as the government? That's the issue we're trying to determine. If you're speaking as you, the government interest is much lower. If you're speaking as the government, well, the government interest is much higher. So that's one of the relevant issues here. The district court concluded that Nagel was not speaking as a citizen in the interview. 
That would be as a private citizen, right? Government actor versus state actor. He agreed to be interviewed as a representative of the Fraternal Order of Police, was identified as a police officer, his gun and handcuff were visible, and the story subject was, was feud and fraud at the courthouse. We agree. Nagel argues he spoke as a citizen because he removed his badge, left the courthouse, instructed Stanwood not to identify him as an officer, and he took comp time, which is basically saying he was on his own personal time, not government time. However, Nagel told the interviewer he knew about the photo sent for, to the whistleblower hotline, did not know who sent it, but he can say it's someone that would be in fear of losing their job. These references to internal law enforcement affairs make clear to the viewing public that Nagel's appearance at the interview was ordinarily within the scope of his duties as a member of the police and president of the Fraternal Order Police. When a government employee answers a reporter's questions involving matters relating to his employment, there will be circumstances in which the employee's answers will take on the character of an official communication and thus are not entitled to the official protections of the First Amendment because it's the government speech, not your speech. If they're official statements, it's the government's speech and the government's interest. The district court further concluded that Nagel's speech during the interview was not on a matter of public concern because his asserted desire to clear the name of Dominic Brim, his Facebook alias, was a purely private interest. Nagel argues that government malfeasance is a matter of public concern, even if the allegation proves to be false. That is no doubt true. Regarding the employer's interest in preventing disruption and disharmony in the workplace, however, the police department, as a public safety organization, has a more significant interest than a typical government employer in regulating the speech activities. The false whistleblower allegation implied that Sheriff Kaiser had violated the law by misusing government property, a theme fostered by Nagel's participation in the interview. This triggered an investigation into whether members of each, either agency had committed criminal defamation and lengthy internal investigation. After over 30 internal investigation interviews, the inventor of interview investigators found Nagel lied in the interview and again in his internal interview by denying he knew who sent the whistleblower packet, a finding which the review board and Chief Edinger adopted. The finding that Nagel had been dishonest, even if wrong, made him a Giglio implied officer and great case name because prosecutors would now be required to disclose that finding any time he testified. So the fact that he lied in this interview and in his internal investigation, so he held he held back the name of this whistleblower. He lied. So maybe that's laudable in one sense. But in another sense, it's also a problem because he's a police officer. So he's an impaired officer because now it becomes something that they have to disclose anytime that he's going to be on the stand, right? It's Brady material. So the fact that he lied during an internal investigation is something they have to disclose. So he's a compromised officer. And now every defense attorney, well, isn't it true that you are a liar? You know, so he's a compromise in that sense. So maybe it was good that he kept the name secret, but because he lied in the interview, that means they'd have to disclose it as part of every defense case. So his ability to be a police officer is now seriously compromised as a result. For these reasons, we conclude the district court properly granted defendant's summary judgment dismissing Nagel's First Amendment retaliation claim because he failed to provide his speech as a public employee was protected under the First Amendment under the relevant case law. So that is the end of our discussion of Nagel versus the city of Jamestown, North Dakota. In this case, we learned that Mr. Nagel was a police officer and he was also the head of the Fraternal Order Police. And he may have given information regarding potential malfeasance and misappropriation of funds. But he also lied during the interview in saying that he didn't know where it came from when the investigation seemed to suggest that he did know. And because he lied, he was a compromised person. Uh, so he may have given speech that was uh, outside of his governmental capacity. So he may have been, may have been immune from that sense, but he unfortunately was compromised because having lied in an internal investigation, now, not, that now becomes Brady material, would have to be disclosed to every defense person uh, going forward. So his ability to work as a police officer was significantly compromised because he, of his lie in the internal investigation, even if that lie was to protect a whistleblower, which might have been him. But in any case, he is no longer a police officer. He can be fired. It is not a First Amendment violation because it was not his private speech, but the government speech, and he's been compromised. And that is the end of our coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel, and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later.
cheers, and goodbye.